Hello and welcome to Ask Echo Meter. My name is Carrie Ann Taylor, and along with myself from Echo Meter, we have Gustavo Fernandez, who will be running the chat and assisting with Q&A. Also, Lynn Rowland, Tony Podio, Ken Skinner, and Dieter Becker. So today we're holding a liquid level workshop, and we'll begin with talking through some basics and best practices of acquiring a fluid level shot. Once you've acquired data, then it's up to you to decide which method to use to determine the depth to the liquid level. So we're going to go through the three methods for calculating the liquid level depth. And then after that, we'll open up the liquid level workbook and start putting up some scenarios and data, talk through analyzing the data, and then uh, knowing what to look for when you're analyzing data to make sure you've analyzed the data correctly. So there is an Ask Echometer page that's accessible from our Echometer website homepage. So you can go there right now if you'd like and download the Session 10 PDF documentation bundle. That contains a PDF of today's presentation and two technical papers that Lynn will reference. Right next to that, there's a link for the Liquid Level Workbook and TAM examples where you can download a folder that contains Liquid Level Workbook as well as all of the examples you'll see us work through today. And that's also where I will post a link to, to um, access a recording of today's session on our YouTube channel. So with that, Lynn, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to get started. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Uh, this is a how-to that we uh, have prepared previously for uh, classes that we teach on introductory uh, classes on uh, our TAM our TAM software. So um, it's a, a document that's been around for quite a while, but we modified it a little bit. Uh, we have how-tos for all the different tests that we do, and uh, usually we hand those how-tos out uh, during a class on a memory stick, and we, we haven't got them on the web page yet. Uh, there's also quick references that are available in manuals inside the TAM software, so if you go out to our Echometer web page here and install the TAM asset monitor software on your web on, from our web page onto your computer then there's a help button that you can also uh, click on that will uh, show uh, step by step uh, how to use the software to acquire data. Uh, there's there's uh, three references here on the, the page. Uh, one is a paper that we presented at the Southwest Petroleum Short Course back in 2003 which is a discussion on uh, how ac how to shoot a fluid level and analyzing the data and what features are available to uh, analyze an acoustic trace. And then there's another a paper that is on our webpage you can download, and it's called Acoustic Velocity of Natural Gas. And it's there's a link to that paper that's on our webpage, and it shows acoustic velocity curves. And I'll show a couple toward the end of this presentation. And then the uh, other reference I put here is Direction of Kick, and that's that's the first uh, Ask Echometer session that we did where we went through and showed many different fluid level traces and many different examples where downhole markers are used and how to identify Direction of Kick and how you use the downhole marker to determine distance of liquid. And so that, that's that's discussed in a, in a presentation uh, that you can download already on our web page. It's presentation number one. I'd like to thank uh, Carrie Ann and Gustavo and Dr. Podio for their help on this presentation. Uh, this is a little kind of diagram or picture and it shows your laptop with your TAM software icon here. Uh, this is called the base station. It's a wireless uh, device that talks to, has two radios that talks to sensors attached to the well. And you get the best results if you have line of sight to the sensor. If you walk between the sensor and the base station, then your body is somewhat impermeable to radio waves. So to get this to go, you need to plug your base station USB cable into the laptop and also plug the cable into the base station. Once you get the laptop turned on, it's going to recognize this USB device is connected. And it will load drivers to make all the communication and data file transfer work properly. Once you've got your laptop logged on to, you can then 
load the TAM software. And we've already talked about the software you can download from our, our web page. This is the base station here with the two antennas, and it can access multiple sensors at the same time. This is showing a picture of a gas gun attached to the well. Now we have basically five different types of gas guns. And the, the simplest gas gun that we have probably is a compact gas gun. And it's usually the device, the gas gun that is sold with our uh, manually operated paper strip chart recorder called the Model N. Then these two gas guns are called remote fire gas gun. The one on the top 2A is a wired remote fire gas gun. It's used with the wired well analyzer. And this is the wireless uh, remote fire gas gun. And it you can see the pressure transducer here attached externally to the, to the remote fire wired gas gun, but the pressure transducer is internal to the remote fire wireless gas gun. And you've got some switches here that you can turn the gun on and off. We'll discuss how this works uh, later on in the presentation. And then these two gas guns are the 5,000 PSI gas guns that we have that have a working pressure up to 5,000 PSI. These three gas guns have the same microphone. They're very sensitive. Pressures less than 1,500 PSI provide excellent, excellent results when you shoot a field level on a well with, with a pressure less than 1,500 PSI. Around about 1,000 PSI and higher, the 5,000 pound gas gun starts to perform. The microphone starts to perform as well, or pretty much as well as these other three gas guns here. Uh, this gas gun can be used, can use the pressure from the well to create a shot, and so can the compact gas gun. And so when you fire the 5,000 pound gas gun, it's manually operated. You rotate the handle from closed, then to open, it's open here, and then all the way 180 degrees to closed. And that rapidly do that, and you don't shake the gun, and that creates a, a change in pressure between the well and the gun. And you can either shoot the pressure from the well into the gun or shoot the pressure from the gun into the well. And we talked about explosion, implosion shots in that uh, ask echo meter number one session. And this is this gas gun has the smallest volume chamber. The volume chamber in this gas gun is one cubic inch, whereas this gas gun has about seven cubic inch volume chamber. And these the default size is uh, about 12 cubic inches of volume, and this is about 10 cubic inches. And and generally, what you can say is that the bigger the volume, the more energy you can have in the shot. But also, the more pressure you have, the more energy you have in the shot. So this gas gun is often often used at very high pressure and it can make a tremendous shot because even you try to you, you, you do not create more than a thousand psi differential to make the shot but even a thousand psi differential pressure at 14,000 psi is a huge amount of energy so it, it makes an excellent it's an excellent gun for high pressure in wells uh, so the, the, these two guns do explosion only and the other gas guns do explosion or implosion, but this is an implosion gun only here. So each of the gas guns have certain ranges that, are, that work best in, and each of the gas guns have different features, but, but all of them can have a way to create a, a volume difference in pressure, a quick opening valve, a way to measure pressure, and so those are typical things that all the gas guns have. A long time ago, over 20 years ago, uh, we had black powder guns that we sold, and the black powder gun was a 10 gauge shotgun shell or a 45 caliber blank. And if you were to take a 10 gauge shotgun shell and fire the shotgun into a room, you would think you blew out your eardrums. But if you put 300 pounds of pressure in this compact gas gun and release the pressure, that's equivalently the equivalent same amount of energy in the shot. So the gas guns deliver a lot, a lot more energy than the black powder guns. They're cleaner, safer, cheaper to operate. So if you once you have the software, TAM software loaded, and you're going to shoot a flow level, then we need to go in and, and select select the, the well. And so here we picked, click this button, and we have selected a group of wells, and this is called the example example group. And we've dropped the list down, and there's the V11 well, and that's a well that's close to Echo Meter in Wichita Falls, Texas. And so when we click on this uh, well name, the well name, the well is going to open up, and we're going to be using this this example well, V11 well, to shoot a flow level. Now, 
if you don't have a well, then you need to create the well file or the well information, the well version. And the, um, that's done by clicking the, the edit button and we'll talk about data input toward the end of the presentation. Information is used about the well when you shoot the flow level. So if you, I think all we have to have is possibly formation depth to shoot a flow level. You need the pump depth for pump intake pressure if you're going to count collars and you average joint length. And there's additional data you need. And we'll talk about that later. Now, to get the well to load, you can either click on the well and click on the load button, or you can double click on it. I usually double click on it. If you don't see your well easy, you can just type in a few characters here and it'll search, and then you can click on the well to open the well up. Now, this is Ken at the well, and he's inspecting the uh, connection, this uh, 90 that goes into the casing of the well, casing annex of the well. Uh, he's looking for any kind of uh, debris, he's going to clean it off. Uh, any kind of corrosion, he wants to make sure that the gun will attach without any uh, restrictions to the threads. And when he attaches a gun, this is MPT threads, he's going to make four and a half turns to make a, a safe connection. If it doesn't make four and a half turns, it may mean the threads are damaged and then you may need to inspect the threads and maybe re replace that uh, 90 or the connection to the well. Uh, normally we put Teflon tape to prevent galling of the threads on the gas gun. Uh, you can use grease if you want, but grease is usually a lot messy, so I prefer Teflon tape. Now here's a little video of Ken going to attach the gas gun. He he's going to, he needs to know the, the pressure of the well before he attaches a, the gun to the well. He needs to make sure that the gas the pressure of the rating of the gun, the working pressure is 1500 psi, exceeds the pressure on the well. He shouldn't really attach the gun, any equipment to the gun that has a, a pressure rating lower than the 1500 pounds of pressure. If you if you put something like a quick connect on the gun, then that could fail and cause cause harm or damage your equipment. When you attach the gun, you're going to want to close off all other pipes that come in. And here's uh, the other uh, casing valve we're going to close. So when we shoot the foot level, it's going to send a pressure wave down the annulus of the well. Before we open the valve here between the gun and the well, we're going to want to charge that gas gun to a pressure greater than well pressure. And that will that will prevent any debris from flowing back into the gun with the gas pressure if we open the valve between the gun and the gun's not charged. Before you fire the shot, you need to make sure this valve is open. It'll just be wasted effort if you fire the shot with open, opening the valve. If you had a black powder gun you forgot to open the valve, then the black powder gun, when the 10 gauge shotgun would go off, it would break the microphone. The microphone here is, is sturdy. And if you fire the shot, uh, with the valve closed, it just won't record a fluid level and it won't damage the microphone. Uh, when you connect to the well, your gas gun to the well, you need to be fairly close to the well. Um, when you shoot a fluid level, you get some echo here, but it's such a high, it's a high rate, really fast, and you don't see it. So when you put your gun, let's say 30 feet from the casing annulus, then you shoot the fluid level, it can build an echo in this, in this area here and it will disrupt the echoes from down in the well and make it hard to count the collars. So the farther the gas gun is from the casing analyst of the poor quality usually the, the collar count is. So we like to have the, the gas gun within five foot of the annulus. Now when you charge a gas gun you have a choice between CO2 and nitrogen typically and the CO2 is in a container, a cylinder and the pressure in the, there's liquid CO2 on the bottom typically and, and CO2 gas on the top. And every pound of CO2 is equivalent to about 100 shots from your gas gun. So if you carry a five pound CO2 bottle around with you to the wells, you can get about 500 shots, a lot of shots. This talks about the vapor pressure and the vapor pressure of CO2 gas is determined by the, the temperature of the of the cylinder of the CO2 and at, at low temperatures, let's say minus 50, which I don't think anybody would be at, but almost really cold, the vapor pressure of this in CO2 is only 120 psi. So you're somewhat limited in cold temperatures 
when you use CO2 gas to shoot little levels. But in the summertime, most of the time, the CO2 gas would be great and you get a lot of shots. So in the wintertime, when it's cold, a lot of people use nitrogen gas. And sometimes they use CO2 in the summer. If you use, if you track a plunger, or if you do a pressure transient test, and typically the gas that you'll use will be nitrogen gas. Uh, the nitrogen gas is supplied at a pressure higher than the working pressure of the gas gun, so you may need to use a pressure regulator to limit the charge pressure into the gas gun. The CO2 vapor pressure is always going to be less than 1500 psi. Now this just shows the, the standard 5 pound CO2 uh, cylinder. It's it, these so these show the parts of the hose. One of the problems you'll have when you're charging the gas gun, if you drop the hose in the dirt, you'll get some sand or debris in here, and it might stick this valve core when you try to fill your gas gun. Uh, the order of these uh, O-ring washer valve core O-ring is important, and if you try to charge your gas gun and it leaks, the, the hose seems to leak or the gas gun leaks, often it's because either this uh, little washer is missing. Or they're not in the right order. So whenever you have a, when you try to charge your gas gun, and you you see seems like it has a leak, then uh, check these to the order here and make sure those are in the right right order. We we have a smaller two pound uh, cylinder that uh, it still would be a, a lot of shots. So you can either use a five pound cylinder or a two two and a half pound cylinder. And this is just kind of showing the idea that uh, if you set the tank on the ground, the cylinder on the ground, the liquid CO2 is on the bottom and the CO2 gas is on the top. And ideally you would set the tank on the ground before you charge the gas gun so that you charge it, the gas gun from the gas on top of the cylinder. If you're tall and you carry this, the CO2 cylinder underneath your arm and you bend over then the CO2 liquid can run to the bottom if you bend this upside down and then you'll fill your, your gas gun with the liquid CO2 that's at the up near this valve, so try not to turn the cylinder upside down when you charge your gas gun. A few people have done that in the past. This just shows the different nitrogen cylinders. This is one you might carry around. Uh, it's not, not a very large volume and you have a limited number of shots, maybe 50 or 60 depending on the pressure. Uh, this would be a large volume, a large nitrogen cylinder you might uh, fix in your truck and you might have a long hose that you just pull the hose over to the well. Uh, how much charge pressure you charge your gas gun with? Well, if you read the, a book or the manual that we have, usually it says 150 to 200 psi pressure differential compared to the well pressure, uh, and that will give you a good shot. That's true if the well is about four or five thousand foot deep, but deeper wells, smaller annuluses, noisy wells can require more more differential pressure. Shallow wells may require less pressure to shoot the fluid level. But the right amount of pressure is the right amount of pressure to charge the gun to get a, a good shot. So you need to de determine the amount of pressure to charge your gas gun based on the quality of your shot. A shallow fluid level will mean less pressure and a deep fluid level with lots of gas flow will often mean more gas, more charge pressure. Now here Ken is charging the gas gun and this is, he hasn't done a zero offset on the gun, and so this valve is still closed here uh, between the gun and the well. We want the charge pressure to be greater than the well pressure when he opens this valve, so that when he opens the valve, no debris enter the, enters the gun. And that's a significant step because that limits the amount of repair on your gas gun. If you, if you forget to charge your gas gun before you open this valve, or you do it as a matter of practice, every time you open this valve, a little bit of debris may be blown in your gun, and eventually it's going to cause your gun to require uh, service and replacing the O-rings that get cut by the debris. There's a bleed valve on the side of the gun, and we need to open that bleed valve if we're going to do a zero offset. Now the wireless gas gun has a switch on it, and this, this shows the old uh, plastic switches, and we have metal ones that, that are uh, very much uh, liquid resistant. So uh, you, you, turn, you turn it on, when you turn it on, you see the LED flash, and every flash represents 10%. And so if it did six flashes, you'd, and they're pretty quick, you have to count quick. That would mean that the battery inside the, this, this little uh, 
protective housing has a 60% charge. And so you just push that button to turn it on. Uh, now we've got the gas gun attached and we have selected the well. And we're going to select the liquid level option and we click that little uh, tiny uh, symbol for an acoustic trace. And the screen opens up and we need to uh, select the gas gun that we have attached to the well. Select the sensor and it will automatically pick the one that you previously used. If you have multiple gas guns that you use and you may want to pick uh, the one that you attached. And if you have a wired system, you, have, you also have to t identify the pressure transducer when you do a, when you do your zero offset. All right, so we select the gas gun. And now there's no pressure on the gas gun. The bleed valve on the gas gun is open. And we click this button once to obtain a zero offset. There's no pressure on the gas gun. And this is the difference in the pressure reading from when we calibrated in Wichita Falls, Texas, and now when you have it on the well with no pressure on it, it's a difference offset of about 3.8 psi. And you wait about 20 seconds, and after 20 seconds or so goes by, you can click it again and say use this uh, zero offset, and that will be the adjustment it makes when you shoot the fluid level to the pressure. So this is the adjustment it'll make to the pressure readings that it, that it acquires based on you doing a zero offset. Uh, you should probably do an, a zero offset at each well. That's, that's probably the best practice. If the temperature doesn't change at all, then zero offset may not be required, but a zero offset is a quick check to make sure your equipment's working properly. If you see a sudden big change or some kind of unusual reading, then there's, there may be some kind of problem that you can identify by just doing a zero offset. So that's, that's kind of the first check on communication when you do your zero offset. And now we're going to shoot the well. And we need to charge this. We got the gas gun charged up. And we're going to open the valve between the gas gun and the well. We're going to close the bleed valve. And we're going to close all of the valves. So here's Ken putting down his cylinder. And he's going to, op he's going to close the bleed valve. And then he's going to open the valve between the gun and the well. He's got, got it open, and that makes a little pressure change and make a little noise on the acoustic trace. And he's going to go over here and he's going to close this other valve. And now, by isolating the, the, the casing annulus, it's like a, a big tank in the ground. And we're measuring the pressure at the surface, and we use that pressure buildup at the surface to calculate the, the gas flow rate into the annulus past the pump. And we use the pressure buildup when you shoot the full level to also adjust the height of the liquid level for the effects of uh, free gas bubbles uh, holding the liquid, le liquid level up. Okay, so now we've got our gas gun, we've got it turned on, and the software is on liquid level, and um, the gas gun and the TWM soft TAM software are talking back and forth. And when we press the acquire button, then the the gas gun prepares to get to the point where it can fire a shot. And as soon as the fire shot button it turns green, it's ready to fire the shot, and then you can push the fire shot button, and the TAM software knows that the shot has been fired, and it will collect the data without you walking back and forth between the gas gun and the well. That's a, that's a really significant time saving and it was impressive to see that the first time when I went out to the field with an operator where he walked over the well and attached the gun and turned the gun on and pressed the acquire button and then he pressed the fire button and the TAM software just kept up with him as he collected the data which was which was pretty slick. Uh, so this is the prepare shot. We're getting ready to take a shot. This is a back, back, background screen and this is a noise that's being displayed here in real time and it's scrolling past the screen and this is the, the zero offset that is, it's reading zero right now we have opened a valve between the gun and the well and it says that there's background noise is 2.61 if it gets up to five it's going to say it's noisy and this little square will turn red and it'll say we need to add uh, additional pressure to make a good shot and so here's the same steps that are shown right here and we're going to follow those steps to uh, fire the shot. You can see here that the gas gun is, is communicating. It's, it's acquiring data and this data is being displayed here 
you see that the battery is fully charged and the quality of the signal it shows one two three four five bars and so we have a good a good quality signal and if we fire the shot on the software it will take the shot or if we fire the shot button on the take the shot button on the gas gun fire the shot it will also take a shot and so you can start the acquisition from the laptop and the laptop can tell the gas gun to start the new test and you say start a new test and when this touch this button turns green then you can fire the shot from the software or you can do the same exact steps from the wireless gas gun and so here it's showing that we've got a wired system that we would operate from the from the software or a wireless gas gun we might operate from the well head which again it, it, it takes it takes saves a little bit of time here Ken is pushing the fire shot button and we've got the volume chamber charged and it's a pressure greater than the well pressure and we push that fire shot button a, a solenoid quickly opens uh, in less than a, a hundredth of a second it's really quick and that creates a sudden release of pressure from the gas gun into the well and that's a like bang the shot goes off and that creates a, a pressure change which becomes a push on the gas and that sends the push or the or pressure wave traveling down the casing of, uh, of the pipe, the casing of the tubing, which every your gun's attached to and any change in cross-sectional area will echo back to the, the microphone and will detect a little change in pressure back at the microphone and we'll see those echoes on the acoustic trace uh, the microphone inside the, the, the remote fire gas gun, the compact gas gun, the 5,000 pound gas gun all have dual disc elements and that can uh, cancel noise that you shake the gun and so that's, that's why their two elements can reduce noise from vibration uh, we've got the pressure sensor it's a, a thin film a pressure sen sensor inside the gas gun here if you don't see the pressure sensor uh, on the outside of the wireless gas guns so here we just fire the shot and this is just a recording of a real, real shot at the, at, the, at the software and this is the acoustic trace, there's our liquid level, and this is uh, seconds of time and the, the, the shot records the time of the shot, usually based on the formation depth about three seconds per thousand foot and here we counted callers down to this depth automatically there's our liquid level identified at the knee of the kick and this, the software says acquiring a shot and then now it's gone through and analyzed it and it used the default method to count callers so uh, at this at this current time we're building pressures and the after we go for a couple minutes the software will say uh, do you want to end the buildup and if you uh, it can the pressure buildup can go for 15 minutes and these points are spaced about every five seconds <clears throat> so now we've got our shot acquired and we're saving the pressure buildup and um, we've determined the distance to liquid based on the default method of counting callers the round trip travel time is the time from when the motor when the valve opened at, at zero time uh, till the echo which is this is round trip it went from the surface down the casing to the liquid level and back Here's the echo back at the surface in 8.418 seconds. That's called round trip travel time, RTTT, in seconds. Uh, we counted the joints. Uh, there's 136.78 joints uh, from processing the fluid level shot from the beginning of shot to the liquid level indicator. Uh, the C line is how many callers we counted. We counted. And we'd like to see that C line close to 85 percent of the total well depth and if it's high like this we might charge the gas gun to a high pressure and then and then reshoot the well to get a, a better collar count notice that it says acquiring and that when it says acquiring that means we're still building pressure now the first step you do is you're going to uh, record the details about this shot and so this was an explosion shot we shot down the casing uh, we access the screen by clicking click the details button and the well is producing when we, we fire the shot 
And so those are the those this information should be recorded for each shot you acquire on the well. Now, TAM has picked the liquid level automatically, and it's supposed to be right at the bend, right where it bends, called the knee of the kick. So right there, and it looks like it's exactly at the knee of the kick, but if you click Fine Tune and you select Liquid Level, then you can zoom in. You can see that the, the knee is right there where it bends, and, and, it, and it picked a little bit uh, to the right. And then you can take your mouse and grab that line and then move that back right to the corner like that. And that's, that's probably the correct distance to liquid. It'll, it'll make a little bit. So every the, 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 the acoustic signal is acquired 1,000 data points per second. That's called 1,000 a, a hertz. And each thousandth of a second is about about that much, about about six inches of, of distance. So um, you know, so if you move if you move this line over a thousandth of a second, that's about a half of a foot. It's important to inspect the near the near the kick and make sure it's picked correctly. And the software processes the, the signal and it determines the the best interval to count the callers and then it uses the best interval to create a filter so that it can count as many as many caller echoes as possible and then it determines the average uh, joint length over the uh, section where it counted the callers from the surface down to the sea line. Now when we look at the depth determination method the, the default method is number one, caller count. And there's other methods that we'll, we'll talk about acoustic velocity and, and down a marker method was talked about during uh, the first Ask Echo Meter session. So when we, when we click on the caller count method and the screen that pops up is this screen right here. And the yellow bar here represents the one second interval that has been selected to, to count the callers by the software by automatically it selected this one to two seconds. So if you look at this trace, there's a kick, there's a kick, there's a kick. And you can see that these kicks aren't quite lining up. And, and I probably should take this um, line right here. You can take the first line or the last line and, and move them to line them up. So I might move this line a little bit to the right to get a little better alignment. But I don't, I don't think I did it in this case. Um, one thing I sometimes do when I looked at, when, I, when I'm used to using the old TWM software, is I used to take this 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 one second band and take this little dot and, and make it two seconds to make these uh, caller echoes closer together. So I've been used to seeing the callers in TWM closely spaced and in TAM they're spaced out more like you'd see on the paper strip chart recorder where this distance is about uh, 3.6 inches or so. So this is more like the callers you see on a strip chart recorder but and I've gotten pretty used to seeing them in TAM now, and so I don't usually change this width. But if I was a new user of TAM, I might I might spread that out to make the callers look more like the TDBM callers, and eventually you'll get used to seeing them in this larger larger scale. So here I clicked and I went to a different second, and so I've I've taken this yellow band, one second band, I slid it down to another area. And I'm trying to find the best area where I can get this caller count line, the C line, to go to the deepest depth. And so what this what it does, the TAM software looks at this one second and it says, in this one second, this interval from and it's from like 3.6 to 4.6 seconds, there's 16.6 .6 joints per second. And if I take this 16.6 uh, .6 joints per second and I create a, a range, a, a band, a band, I can put minus two joints per second plus two joints per second I can create a band and so when I when I click on this all callers screen it says I'm going to create this band here from 14.15 to 18.15 seconds and I'm going to count any echo that that looks like a caller and so what it does it, it runs a filter called a bandpass filter and there's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten joints or 11 callers and then we get down to this so that's 10 20 
30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 1, 2, 3, 83. So we counted 83 collars or joint, joints, 84 collars, and that gives a, an, and then it uses that as a joints per second. Right here, the average joints per second over this interval from that point to that point, and then it takes this average joints per second over the entire round trip travel time to give us the joints, the total distance to liquid level. So that's how we come up with the distance to liquid level. Now, and this is just kind of showing it. We went through and we have 8.399 seconds to the knee of the kick, round trip travel time. And we have an average acoustic velocity of 1031 that came from the all caller screen. And if we divide the time by two times the, times the average acoustic velocity, that gives us a distance of 4,330 feet to the liquid level. And you divide it by two because this is, this is round trip. So from that point to that point is round trip travel time. And to get the one-way travel time, you have to divide the round trip travel time by two and then times the average acoustic velocity or the average joints per second to get the distance to the liquid level. Now, the software comes up and says, hey, do you want to end the pressure buildup? And you can, you, can, you can expand it by clicking that little expand button to see the full screen. Or you can click the end buildup button to stop it after a couple minutes. So here when we click the expand button to expand it, this is the entire screen now is taken up with the pressure buildup. And you can see that there's not a lot of pressure buildup in this well. It's only building up about 0.15 PSI per two minutes. And that means a very small amount of gas is going to the casing, maybe three or four MCF per day. And the software calculates that and displays it in the report. And so here we've, we started off with a casing pressure of 11.3 PSI. And it's built up 0.15 PSI in two, two minutes. Two minutes time is that last point. It's building up because gas is flowing into the casing annulus past the pump. And the casing valve at the surface to the flow line is closed. And the buildup is means pressure buildup means gas is flowing. And then the software knows to calculate a gas angular gas flow rate with the increase in pressure and adjust the height of the gassy fluid column for the effects of gas. So when you shoot a fluid level, these are the kind of questions you can add, answer. You can say, what is, you're going to turn the distance to the top of the liquid, liquid level depth. Uh, you can see is the pump submerged, and that will mean your fluid level is going to be above your pump. Based on the, the buildup pressure, you can see the percent liquid or the gradient of the fluid, so we can calculate the pump intake pressure and also calculate the bottom pressure based on the gradient of the fluid. If, if gas is flowing up the casing, the pressure built up, and then we can calculate the gas flow rate. It's going to be greater than zero. And we compare the producing ball pressure to the static bottom of pressure. Then we can see if the percent draw the efficient producing efficiency is high, and we would like to see the producing efficiency high and have a, a, a low producing mole pressure compared to our reservoir pressure. Now, if the casing pressure at the surface is high, that will that will can reduce inflow. Or if the liquid level is high, that can cause additional pressure and reduce inflow. So when we shoot the fluid level, we see if the the if the if the producing efficiency is low. Is it low because the casing pressure is too high, or is it low because the liquid level is there's too much liquid pressure on the formation? And the pressure is what restricts the inflow. If the pressure can be from high casing pressure, it can be from high liquid level, or it can be the sum of both can be restricting the inflow due to high uh, producing mole pressure. And based on comparing the producing mole pressure to the reservoir static pressure, and we know the producing rate, oil and water liquid rate, at the time of the producing fluid level shot, then we can calculate what the maximum production rate available from the well is, and we can see how close we are to producing all that liquid from, from the well. And so those are important questions that we can answer. And if we look at the report, we, we can see the same thing. We can see that we have one distance to liquid, and, we, and it looks like we have meters. So the units in TAM are user selectable and you can save whatever format of, me, of units you want. So this is meters and then US barrels and an MCF. And so this is kind of a, a mixture of units of, of meters and US units for, for volume and then US units for pressure, but you could show pressure as atmospheres or 
or KPAs or bars. And so we can see each of these, each, there's the distance to liquid, liquid above the pump, both the gas free, adjusted based on uh, gas flow, and the total height of fluid above the pump in meters. And then here is the current production rate, and there is the maximum production rate. Looks like we can get a little more liquid out of this well, but not much more oil by drawing it down to 100%. And we're producing 97% of all the fluid available because the fluid was down here at the pump. And the gas flow rate is only 3.6 MCF, and that's because the buildup rate is only about 0.2 psi per minute, not to a minute and 30 seconds, not very much pressure buildup. The fluid properties: 75% of the the height of liquid above the pump is liquid, and then 25% is is uh, gas bubbles. So it's it's not uh, all liquid. You have to adjust it for the height of liquid level to calculate pressure properly uh, based on the gas bubbles that are present in the liquid above the pump. And then we have the pressures, the pressure the pump intake, pressure at the bottom, the reservoir pressure, and the pressure at the liquid, liquid gas-liquid interface. And so there's our, our report that answers those questions. Uh, and this just shows the, the when we click on report here, this report pops up and the report is in a PDF format and so that wasn't available in TWM but now when you go to TAM the report automatically is shown in PDF format it has a much nicer uh, presentation than TWM had and the report can be emailed to someone or it can be printed as a report on a printer or it can be saved as a file on your computer as a PDF file so you have these options and then there's also an option where you can Add, customize this report, and put your own company logo right here. So those are all, all, all uh, in, enhanced features in the TAM software. Plus, here the well is producing, so we have a producing test. And if we had a static test, we could change it right here and say it's a static. You don't click this and change it to static if the well hasn't been shut in for like three or four days, and it's been, and there's no change in the producing flow level, no change in the pressure. So this is a, a, produce, a producing test. Now the, the shot's been acquired. We and we try to usually take two shots. And here's Ken's going to remove the gas gun from the well. Before he takes the gas gun off, there's pressure on this on this gun, so he has to close this valve between the well. It's closed now between the gun and the well, and he has to open the the, the bleed valve, the little T handle on the gun, and release the pressure before he takes the gun off the well. So what we just did, we just talked about shooting the fluid level. We had our gas gun attached to the casing of the well and we fired the shot and this valve between the gun and the well quickly opened and released a blast of pressure into the well and that created a pressure wave that traveled at the speed of sound or acoustic velocity down the well and any change in reflection like a collar or an anomaly in the well would reflect a portion of that pressure back to the microphone and that would be recorded at the surface, it's called, we call that the acoustic trace. So, the, so based on the threshold voltage, we see the shot go off. And that's, that's how the shot is selected, based on the compared the beginning signal to the, your limit that you have in your software called threshold voltage. And that's a, a feature under uh, utilities, a setting. And then here are all the uh, echoes from the well coming back. And these are what? These are collars and things like that. And then there's a little kick right there that, that may or may not belong. We call that an anomaly. And then there's our liquid level down here. And so we, um, the microphone senses change in pressure from changes in cross section in the well bore uh, versus, versus time. And then based on the acoustic velocity we determine, we turn the, the time into depth. And so here's the relationship between time and depth is a Acoustic velocity kind of divided by two. Now, one of the analysis methods that we're going to talk about here is the acoustic velocity method. And so we we live in a world where we hear sounds. And so we're pretty comfortable with the idea of, of, of sound because we hear with sound. And so I remember when I was a, a little a little kid riding in out at the farm with my dad and a thunderstorm would come up and I would be afraid and, and I'd see a lightning and he'd say 
how far is the lightning away? And I'd say he taught me to count. Count 1,000, 1, 1,002. And after I count to five, I can't believe I did. I was a little kid. But I count to five and I'd say, well, that's one mile. And so I guess he distracted me from being afraid by getting me to count the time between the seeing the flash and then hearing the boom. You know, the flash is, the flash is instant. You know, light travels very quickly compared to the speed of sound in air. Now, why would you want to use acoustic velocity? Because you might have a coil tubing in your well where there's no collar. So you might need to use sometime uh, an, an uh, acoustic velocity method uh, to determine depth because there's no collars to count or no down-home markers. So the idea would, would be is that you'd come up with uh, either a gas gravity or a gas composition of the gas in the well or an acoustic velocity that you maybe determined from a, a, a well in the same area has the same gas with the same pressure and either you type in the acoustic velocity and shoot the flow level and know the round trip travel time and divide the time times the velocity by two to get the distance to the liquid level. Now, when you click on the acoustic velocity method, then you can uh, either enter the gas gravity or you can enter acoustic, uh, known acoustic velocity, or you can click on this button and type in the composition of the gas, and then we'll calculate the gas gravity from the composition, and that's then used to determine um, the acoustic velocity based on the pressure and temperature. The pressure, there's a casing pressure, and the average temperature in the well. So there's a temperature at the surface, and you need to type in the bottom hole temperature at the bottom of your well, at your formation depth, and then the software determines the average temperature and then the pressure in the well, and it calculates the acoustic velocity based on pressure and temperature and gas gravity. And if you have impurities, you need to add that in to make an adjustment on the acoustic velocity or composition. So here we've typed in a composition. This is a CO2 well, uh, a CO2 flood out in the Permian Basin of West Texas, 82% uh, CO2, and then there's the other components. And the gas gravity is much higher than air. Air would be a, a acoustic velocity of around, around 1, whereas a, a, a acoustic velocity, a gas gravity greater than 1, a specific gravity greater than 1 would be something like CO2 flood, or a, a, a gas gravity less than 1 would be like a methane a gas well, where there's uh, maybe 0 0.6, 0 0.65 gas gravity. Um, now, on the, the, on the download from the web page is that paper called Acoustic Velocity for Natural Gas and that's also on our web page you can download it and it discusses uh, acoustic velocity versus pressure and temperature. Uh, this TAM software and the TWM software uh, both calculate acoustic velocities from gas gravities and pressures and temperatures or you can go to a chart and if you don't have a good chart then you can send us a composition and we can uh, calculate acoustic velocity chart for you for certain for whatever pressure and temperature range that you have. Now this is uh, two acoustic velocity charts that came with that, that paper we just talked about, acoustic velocity for natural gas. If you if you look, you can see that along this axis is the acoustic velocity, and along the horizontal axis is the terms of pressure and psi, absolute pressure. And then this is metric along this side, metric in, in uh, meters per second, and then uh, I don't know what kg per centimeter squared is, but anyway, I don't think that's kPa. Um, and this is for a methane gas, a 0.6 gas gravity. So this is a, a light gas, and this is a heavy hydrocarbon gas, would be uh, propane and uh, ethanes and butanes might be present. And so if you look at these two, uh, charts, what you see is that as the pressure increases from 0 to 1,000, the acoustic velocity goes down. And then once you get to about 1,000, as the pressure increases, the acoustic velocity increases. And both of these kind of show the same thing. And then as the temperature increases, here's 19, 37, 72, 321. As the temperature goes up, the acoustic velocity goes up. So in a well, when you go down, the temperature increases. And the pressure increases, but at first, if it's not very high pressure, the, the pressure increase is going to cause acoustic velocity to go down, and the temperature increase is going to cause the um, acoustic velocity to go up. So for 
a well that, that might be a, a 5,000 deep, foot deep well that may not have a lot of pressure, uh, the acoustic velocity can be fairly constant versus depth. For a deep well where it's hot, a lot of temperature, a lot of, a lot of temperature may have an increasing acoustic velocity versus depth. Where a high pressure well can have a really quickly increasing acoustic velocity because both the pressure and the temperature are increasing the acoustic velocity versus depth. Uh, so here we've got it. Here's our well. 400 pounds of pressure, and it's 100 degrees of temperature and acoustic velocity for methane gas is around 1400. And you should kind of think about the the gas in your in your field. Uh, what's the gas gravity? And then kind of have a note that these wells have an acoustic velocity for a certain certain range. So this is for a light gas, and so a heavy gas, uh, 400 psi and 100 degrees Fahrenheit is about 785. So the denser the gas, the the slower the acoustic velocity. And that's what this chart shows. This, if you look at this chart, you have increasing uh, gas gravity along the horizontal axis and you see the decreasing acoustic velocity. So if you were to uh, look at this chart, you'd say as the gas becomes heavier for a certain pressure, uh, this is up to about a thousand psi. Then you would see a a decreasing uh, acoustic velocity with increasing gas gravity. Now air doesn't match this. Air is different because it's primarily nitrogen gas, and it doesn't it doesn't behave as a as a uh, hydrocarbon gas based on acoustic velocity. So if you had air in your well, which would be nitrogen gas, it's going to behave differently. And in TAM. If you put 100% nitrogen as your gas component, then the software uses the properties of nitrogen to calculate the weight of the gas and to calculate the acoustic velocity. So uh, TAM has a, a special op option that's turned on when you put 100% nitrogen to use the properties of nitrogen and not treat the gas as a hydrocarbon gas for uh, acoustic velocity and for pressure. Um, this is a example called the Model M example. There's an acoustic trace, and if we look at um, this is a TWM software, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of compare the inputs for TWM and TAM here real quick. And so this is the the same example in both programs, TAM and TWM. And if we look right here, we're going to open the the well information in TWM. If you have an old wired system, that would be TWM. And you can import your data into TAM for, for analysis. Uh, you select the lift method on the general tab in TWM, and that controls what tabs uh, are available to you to, and what's displayed on the tabs inside of TWM. And here on the on the well description tab, um, we um, it's very similar, but there's no there's no lift lift method. The lift method is on the lift system tab in, in TAM. So when you go to the lift system tab, that's where you specify your your lift method. Uh, in in TAM though, we might notice here it says no GPS signal. Well, in the base station in in the wireless system, you have a um, GPS, and when you access the GPS satellites, you can you can click a globe and then update your uh, GPS coordinates in TAM. And so then TAM knows when you come back to that well because you're close to the same coordinates you've been to in the past. So here's the list system tab and this data is not used for fluid level shots. This is your pumping unit data and your electric motor information. And here this same information is in, in TAM under list system. Here's your pumping unit information and it's not used for fluid level shots your prime mover and your rod string and your pump. And here's your wellbore tab in TAM and TWM and we need the tubing size and the casing size and the pump depth and the average joint length is important but it's defaulted so if, if you don't put a value different than 31.7 which is echometer default and you were to call technical support at echometer and say why is my fluid level not at my pump when I know I'm pumped off or below the pump you would look at your average joint length and say well you have the wrong average joint input so uh, 31.7 is the default but uh, you should put your actual average joint length in for your well and so that's important input 
Now at the bottom in TWM, you have your deviation survey. Now in TAM, on the well bore, mechanical well bore, you have your average joint length here for your tubing. tubing. You have your sea nipple depth, which is your pump depth. You have your average, your deviation survey has its own tab. And then your tubing size and your casing size are here. So here's our tubing size and your casing size right there. Um, on the conditions tab in TWM, you have your oil and water production rates, you have your formation depth, you have your reservoir pressure, and you also ought to put your bottom of temperature in and your fluid properties, oil and water properties in TWM, whereas on in TAM, uh, the producing interval is right there. You have multiple intervals in TAM and you can label them, which is which is slick, because they can show up as downhole markers when you have your a liquid level below a perforation an interval. Here's your uh, table of uh, production data, oil, water, gas. It calculates a gradient from those input values. And here's your oil gravity, water gravity, and your fluid properties, and your bottom of temperatures. And those are formation depth comes off the producing interval test. The static bottom of pressure comes off the producing interval test. Uh, but the gravities and production data comes off the well conditions tab inside TAM. <clears throat> and these are all values that are needed to when you shoot a fluid level for calculations. So now you've shot a fluid level and we've got a fluid level shot and you always try to take two shots when you're shooting a fluid level. Um, you, if you don't see a good liquid level kick, um, the first thing to try is probably put more pressure in your gas gun. Uh, you can close the valve between the gas gun and the well and if the noise goes away, it's probably noise from down hole. And that may mean if you're pumped off, you may need to turn your pump off. Or if you are uh, have a really gassy well, you, you may need to uh, put more pressure in the gas gun to make a bigger shot. If you close the well in, and it's a gas well, then the pressure is going to build up and, and make less noise. But it's going to move your liquor level. So it's, it's best to put more pressure in the gas gun and, and take another shot versus closing the well in and increasing pressure because as the pressure goes up liquid level is going to go down if it's a gassy fluid level. If you don't have a good liquid level sometimes it could be a, if it's a wire system it could be a bad cable it could be uh, you might need to do a uh, interference check and check for noise on the wireless system uh, you can check your uh, connections they may be wet so other things you might want to check if you're if you have a poor quality shot uh, you can again increase pressure always gives you more amplitude, more bigger kicks. Um, more pressure moves the liquid level, but it improves the quality of the shot, uh, reduces the noise, and maintains energy in your pressure wave. Uh, turning off noisy equipment can help, uh, but you have to be cautious about that because if you turn off a, a very high producing well, the fluid level will fill in the well bore quickly and cause the fluid level to come up if you're Hot production rate's high, but if it's pumped off, you turn it off, it, it won't really matter because the fluid level won't come up very fast, so it, that won't be a problem. This last thing is important. If you're if you're shooting a fluid level on a well, it's a really gassy well, and the pressure build is fast. If you close the flow line in or the casing valve in very quickly, very long, 10, 20 minutes, the fluid level will move maybe 10 to 15 feet per PSI increase. And so if your pressure increase uh, increases 30 PSI, uh, you can have a fluid level that has moved down uh, 500 feet or more. It can move, it can move a long way. So be cautious about uh, sh uh, shutting the well in and not shooting the fluid level because the liquid level will move quickly. Um, when you shoot a fluid level, normally you're trying to determine answer those eight questions like the distance to liquid, bottle pressure, inflow performance. Now that's called a single shot. Now, if you, we also have ability to do multiple shots. And those are typically used to track the liquid level or to measure the change in pressure versus time. And the pressure, change in pressure versus time is called a pressure transient test. And liquid level tracking would be trying to follow the liquid level and make sure the well, liquid level is not changing too much or some kind of issue about uh, movement of the liquid level versus time. So that uh, concludes my presentation.
Any questions or comments? Yes, we have uh, we have a few questions. And I'm going to start with a question from Jesus Mata. He is asking, uh, what is the well pressure rating in a well that you can work as maximum with the CO2 cylinder? Is it the same with the nitrogen cylinder? No, the working pressure is the same for the gas. It doesn't the, the working pressure of the gas doesn't doesn't change, but the CO2 pressure or vapor pressure usually is going to be less than 800 psi. So if you're trying to do an explosion shot and your well pressure is over 800 psi, then you're going to have to use nitrogen gas. And but that doesn't change the working pressure of the gas gun. It's still the same allowable pressure. Yes. Also important to probably mention that whenever he has a high pressure wells, he may use a different type of gun and not the remote fire gas gun that you were mentioning. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. So if your well pressure is over 1500 psi then you can't use the compact gas gun or the remote fire gas gun because the working pressure is 1500 psi you need to use a 5000 psi gas gun or the 15000 psi gas gun for the higher pressure wells. And even condition where, where the pressure is lower, let's say 800 or 1000 psi, you might, you might need to use probably not a 5k or uh, the compact gas gun to do an implosion shot yeah. instead of an explosion shot. Yeah. Yeah, when the well pressure is high, you can do implosion shots. So uh, that's exactly correct. Yeah. Uh, Dan is asking, are you able to adjust the sampling rate or hertz? Um, you know, for plunger lift and for dynamometer analysis, you can adjust the sampling speed. And that helps when you have um, something that occurs at high speed. So if the plunger falls quickly, you need to sample faster. If there's a tag or a sudden impact load, you need to sample faster. The normal default sampling speed for acoustic traces is a thousand, and there's no option currently in the software to go faster. You can sample faster with the wired equipment up to about almost 4,000 samples per second, but that's with a, a, a sampling program called General Data Acquisition. So. And that's in that's in the manual. If you have a question about GDA or genome you know, data acquisition for higher speed sampling, you ought to contact Echometer and ask about. Okay. Yes. Well, just for the flu level, if he's asking specifically for a regular flu level, uh, no, the, the setup is a thousand hertz. No, that's just it. Just one one speed. It's just one speed you cannot change. Just for regular shot, if you're doing a plunger track and a different type of test, then you have some option to it to change the, the sampling frequency. Okay, we have another question. Uh, well, it's kind of a generic question. If we have or we take three shots, none of them are consistently close. What should we do or consider to do the uh, a little better? Okay, so so. One of, the, one of the problems that often is a question from a customer is the distance to liquids different between the three shots. And so if you can see the liquid level on all three shots, you need to look at the round trip travel time and see if the round trip travel time is close to the same. Because sometimes the difference in the distance to liquid is because the noisy acoustic signal, the color counting is not very uh, consistent from shot to shot. Normally, what I see is that the echo from the liquid level is consistently the same, or uh, very close to the same, and the depth determination sometimes is off because noise on the acoustic trace. So I've had people before find the best collar count and then use that acoustic velocity for the other two shots, and then they find that all the shots are pretty close to the same depth. Uh, normally the fluid level doesn't move a lot unless um, you turn the well off or turn the well on or change the casing pressure. The fluid level is going to be in the same place uh, from shot to shot normally. So yeah, Very close. Usually the, the change is due to a, not a, a regular acoustic velocity calculation that we need to focus on that. Okay, uh, Lupe has an interesting question. Say, on wells they have a tubing anchor right above the perforations, and uh, there is a lot of tailpipe below the tubing anchor. 
and the vertical well makes quite a bit of gas. I have a lot of trouble seeing below the tubing anchor. I can shut in the well for a while, sometimes a few hours, and it allows me to see everything below. But this is good practice, or is there is, is there a better way? Well, there, 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 we wrote a paper on this problem. Carrie Ann wrote a paper for um, the tubing anchor can hold gas, see liquid above the tubing anchor. You might want to read that paper because sometimes the the problem is is that if there's a lot of a lot of distance between the anchor and the intake of the tubing, then the gas can collect in that space between the pump intake and the bottom of the tubing anchor, and then a gassy fluid level can form above the tubing anchor. So there's some tests that you can do to figure that that all out. It's a, it's kind of an unusual, but it's not uncommon for that to happen. So what might be happening in your well is that your wells are holding liquid above a gassy fluid column above the um, anchor and then gas fills from the anchor down to the pump intake and it's difficult to control runtime when you pump the well so uh, that could be the problem that's, that you're seeing you if you want to see past the anchor and there's liquid level above it then you can you can increase the pressure push the liquid level down above the anchor and then when you shoot the fluid level, if the fluid level is a lot deeper the next time you get when you get to the anchor, then that means you're trapping gas below the anchor. So uh, I, again, I'd recommend you read that paper on our webpage. Uh, you ought to email uh, Carrie Ann at echometer.com, and she'll be glad to talk to you about that. Um, another question is: if we if if you're shooting a 10,000 feet well and you expect the liquid level to be near another marker like an anchor, how would you determine which kick is the liquid level and which is the anchor? Well, that's a good question, but normally the, not always, but normally the anchor kick is is is, is, is small. And Carrie Ann's probably showed, will show an example of that. And I know I have many examples in the first presentation that we did on Ask Echometer that showed anchor echoes and liquid level echoes. And if you're really, uh, first of all, the biggest change in cross-sectional area usually is the biggest echo. And then the, the signal gets, the echoes get smaller as you get deeper and deeper in the well because energy is being reduced. So I can't say that always lick level is the biggest echo because it may be deep in the well and there may be something up high that makes a bigger kick. But most of the time, not always, the liquid level is the biggest kick. And then the anchor is going to be a smaller kick. If the liquid level is above the anchor, you won't see the anchor kick. You'll just see one one echo. You'll see your tubing anchor. So, uh, and then you'll see your liquid level. So, uh, you normally can't see anything below the liquid level. So that's I guess that's a yes. So if you see only one kick, that should be the liquid level. If you see two kicks, smaller one first, close to the liquid level, so that should be yeah. the tubing anchor, and just below that, the liquid level kick. Good comment. Okay, um, Brian is asking, is there a possibility to get the liquid level in a gas producer well with a monoboard completion from tubing? Yeah, sure. Here, here's, the, here's the issue. We've talked about gas wells already in one of the Ask Echometer uh, presentations, and it goes and discusses that. So you might want to read that, look at that, or listen to that presentation. But when you shoot a fluid level on a gas well, there's a thing that we haven't talked about here calling being above or below the critical rate. If you're above the critical rate, that means the gas is carrying a high enough velocity, carrying the liquid out of the well, and the liquid level is at the surface. So if you go to a well and shoot a gas well that's flowing at a high gas rate, you won't see anything because the tubing is full of mist or a gassy fluid. If you're below the critical rate, then you shoot the fluid level, you'll see a liquid level because that means that the gas isn't flowing fast enough to get the liquid out. And there's a liquid level in your well. so you have to, there's a spreadsheet that we provided uh, during that presentation, and you can input the conditions of the well, and there's several papers that we provided also that talks about critical rate, and you should calculate, based on your surface pressure and gas flow rate, what the critical rate is, and see if you're in tubing size, and see if you're above below the critical rate. If you're below the critical rate, you're going to see a liquid level. If you're above, if you're below it, you'll see a liquid level. If you're above it, you probably won't see a liquid level. 
And let's uh, go with this last question before Kerry Ann comes with the workbook. And uh, Ibrahim is asking if I have a problem in the case, is the chart going to reflect that problem? Maybe. Um, so if you have a collar, a collar, casing collar that leaks, then there's not really a hole. It's just it's just leaking between the threads. And so you won't you probably won't see that as a echo. If you have a hole that is a hole in the casing, then you'll see a, an upkick. But when you shoot the tubing and casing annulus, you'll have to determine if the hole is in the tubing or is it is the hole in the casing. And so if there's holes in the tubing, you have to shoot down the casing tubing annulus and then shoot down the tubing and see if the upkick shows up on both shots. Block blockages in the casing are look like liquid levels. So if you have a blockage in the casing due to collapse of the casing or some kind of problem like solids, then you shoot the fluid level and the ch pressure changes. If you change the pressure and liquid level doesn't move, then that's probably a blockage. So uh, you can have a salt ring, you can have a blockage, you can have uh, something that won't move. That would be a uh, move with respect to pressure. So yeah, you can shoot a fluid level and see many problems, uh, holes and blockages, and um, but you can't see seeps. You can't see a seep that there's no change in cross-sectional area. Yes, and all this is assuming, of course, the hole is above the liquid level. That's, that's good. probably yeah, also you, a that's common right. problem. People and, attempt to and so, a hole and the fluid level is really high. That's right. So if you're if you think there's a hole, you got to increase the pressure. And push the liquid level below the hole if you want to see an upkick on the casing shot and tubing shot. So that means you shut the well in, or you or you or you inject nitrogen gas to move the liquid level down. Right. Well, that's uh, all we have. So carry on. I think you can jump in now. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks, Gustavo. So this next little portion is going to be going through our liquid level workbook, and on the Ask Echo Meter webpage, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can download the TAM examples if you'd like to go through them with me, or you can also download the workbook. And I'll put a revised version of the workbook out there tomorrow um, once we've gone through all of the answers. So let's go ahead and get started here. So what we're going to do with this workbook is put up a scenario and ask a question, and then we'll sort of talk through the answer. And then we have the TAM data that we can go in and look at just for some additional analysis and tips and things like that. So in this first question here, where is the liquid level? <clears throat> so what things do we need to work, look for? One of the easiest mistakes to make is to trust that the software is going to pick the liquid level correctly for you every time. So that's kind of why I've removed the markers on these initial screenshots just to give your mind a chance to kind of see what you're looking at. So the software has certain conditions it looks for when automatically choosing a liquid level location. One of those conditions is that it looks for the largest downward kick. So right away we see the largest downward kick nice and big here at about 10.5 seconds. Then we see a smaller kick further down the shot trace. So a great way to verify that the liquid level is selected properly is to look at time intervals. So when we analyze our shot in the software, we can turn on that wellbore overlay. We see that TAM has selected the largest downward kick as our liquid level. We see a line here with the C. This is our color count line. So we see that marker, that color count marker letting us know that the software was able to count collars about 80%, 85% maybe of the way down to the liquid level marker, so that looks good. One of the ways that we can identify a liquid level is to look for its repeat, meaning whatever time we see the liquid level at, a repeat of the liquid level may be seen at twice that distance. So here the liquid level occurs at 10.48 seconds. We multiply that time by two, which gives us 20.96, and we see that the liquid level repeat occurs at 20.96 seconds. So there's a time interval of 10.48 seconds here, and then there's another time interval of 10.48 seconds from the liquid level to the repeat here. 
So identifying repeats and time intervals will help verify the liquid level location, as well as any other anomalies that are occurring on the acoustic trace that you see. All right, question number two, which depth determination method should you choose? So Lynn discussed the three methods of calculating the depth to the liquid level. You can use the automatic collar count, you can use a downhole marker, or if you don't have those options, you would use the acoustic velocity. So this is a shot down the casing of a rod pumped well. We see a small down kick at about 13 seconds and a large down kick down here around 17 seconds. And we have a hint down here in choosing which depth determination method to use. And Lynn talked about this too. So the hint is choosing the collar count or marker that's closest to the liquid level results in the most accurate depth calculation. So in our TIM analysis with the wellbore overlay turned on, we see that our collar count is only about 50% of the way down to the liquid level. And we like to see that at least 75 to 80% of the way down for an accurate collar count. We also see that there's this down kick, but there's nothing on the wellbore overlay that's giving us any information about it. So we've got our liquid level selected here that the, the software selected for us, but now we need to check our wellbore schematic to see what this down kick might possibly be. And so when we check the wellbore schematic, we find out that there is a casing weight increase from 26 pound casing to 38 pound casing and that occurs at 5,913 feet. So that casing increase in weight per foot resulted in a down kick on the acoustic trace. So let's go add that into our well file. So the next time we shoot this well, we'll have everything correct and accounted for. So let me get us to TAM here. All right, does everyone see my TAM screen? Yes, okay. All right, so we're on question number two with this casing weight change. All right, so if I want to enter this casing weight change, I'll go to the edit button down here in the lower left-hand corner, and that's gonna pull up my well file. And right here on my mechanical well bore, under the casing, this is where I'm gonna enter that casing weight change because it creates, it creates a little ledge there where the when you shoot that fluid level, that pressure wave travels down and reflects off of that ledge that's created. All right, so the casing weight change was at 5,913 feet. That's down to the bottom. So I'm gonna change this right here to 5,913. And the weight change was from 26 pound casing to 38 pound casing. Okay, so I'm gonna save this. And close that. Now I'm going to turn on my wellbore overlay, and right here I can make that a little bit darker. You see this little opacity marker here? I can make that a little bit darker. All right, so now we see that this down kick occurs right there at this casing weight change. So now that I have I have a marker here from my wellbore schematic that is lower than the collar count that's closer to the liquid level than where the collar count is. All right, so if I go to my downhole markers, then I can use this uh, casing ID change right here at 5,913 feet. I didn't say that. So I can line that up here. All right, and so now I have a marker that's closer than where I was able to get my collar count to. Okay, so we always say that if you have a choice between methods, you should choose the method that gets you closest to where the liquid level's at. And so um, that's what we're saying here. So let's go back to the workbook. All right, so let's compare the two. So here we have the collar count method. And then here we have the downhole marker method. So the collar count method, we are able to get about 50% of the way down, and you see that downhole marker method is a little bit closer. And so um, we are saying that the downhole marker would be the 
more accurate marker to use if you had a choice between the color count method and the downhole marker method. But the calculated, keep in mind the calculated information you see here is directly related to the information that you have input into the well file. All right, so that color count method calculates, if you live right here, calculates that there are 252.1 joints to the liquid level. And we see that there was a similar calculation done using the depth determination using that downhole marker of 249.66, right? So um, that calculated number is based on the average joint length that was entered into the well file. So the default average joint length is 31.7 feet. If your average joint length is actually 29.8 feet and you're using the color count method, your calculated depth is going to be different. Okay, and same thing with um, the wellbore schematic. The downhole marker method is only as accurate as your wellbore schematic. So just keep these in mind for an accurate color count. Make sure that, and Lynn mentioned this too, that you have your average joint length entered correctly. Make sure that the collars are selected correctly by the software. And for the depth determination, make sure that you have an accurate wellbore schematic. You know, that number that you put in is only as good as the, the measurement that was done when that wellbore schematic was created. And another thing you want to keep in mind, and we'll look at a gas lift example where this really comes into play, is choose the correct reflection to line up with that marker. If you have the wrong reflection selected to line up with that marker, then that's going to make your acoustic velocity off, and that's going to give you an error in your liquid level depth calculation. All right, so let's go to number three. All right, where is the liquid level? So when you have a fluid level shot like this that results in multiple kicks, you're going to have to refer to your wellbore schematic to get some more information. So when we look at this shot in TAM with the wellbore overlay, it really helps all of these kicks kind of make sense. All right, so here we have a down kick, down kick, larger down kick, we see an up kick, and there's a series of kicks down here at the end of the acoustic trace. So if we input all the information from our wellbore schematic into our well file, and when we overlay that, that wellbore profile, this is going to be, this small kick here lines up with the tubing anchor. All right, so this is our tubing anchor kick here. This next kick lines up with the top of the liner. All right, see that little ledge here? So there's our liner top. So there's a big kick right there for the liner. Then our next big kick here is our liquid level. Now, just past the liquid level is an up kick. So this is the kick from the increase in area past the liner top. You know, that pressure wave comes down, it hits that ledge on that liner top, so we get this big down kick. Then it hits the fluid level. Now it's on its way back out of the liner, and when it passes that ledge from that liner top, then there's an increase in area. And so we see an up kick here. So you can use that your depth reference line, we can go into TAM and we'll look at that depth reference line and you can calculate the difference. You can calculate the time interval from that down kick to the liquid level and then from the liquid level to that up kick and you're gonna see that same time interval there. Okay, so that's anytime you have a liner in your well, you're gonna see a down kick at the liner, a down kick at the liquid level and lots of times you're gonna see that up kick past the liquid level and that's just that pressure wave coming back out on the other side. There was one other thing I wanted to show you on, on this well, just to give you, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with inputting uh, deviation surveys, this is, this well has a horizontal section. So um, I just wanted to show you quickly where and how to enter that. So along with the, um, the bundle, you should, there's also an Excel spreadsheet that should be with the workbook that has, this is a very small deviation survey, but it's just for practice. Um, so if you go into your well file and click edit, it looks like I already have it in here. If you go to survey, then you have a measure depth and a true vertical depth column. So I can take my measured and true vertical depths from my Excel spreadsheet. And I'm just copying both of those columns and I can come over here and paste them into my well file. All right, and so now we see that the, the wellbore profile has been created. So 
this is going to make a difference, especially on your, your pressure calculations. You know, if, if your liquid level falls in, into this uh, deviated section, then we need to be able to use for the pressure calculations a true vertical depth rather than a measured depth. Otherwise, the software is going to think that all the fluid sitting on top of that is vertical, when in actuality, it, there may be part of that in the horizontal, and you're not going to have the as high of a producing bottom hole pressure as you might, um, as you would have if you had, if you just allow the software to think that it's a vertical well. Because if you don't enter that deviation survey, the software is going to assume that it's a vertical well. All right, so we've got our survey entered here. This is also helpful um, in your dynamometer analysis. If you've got friction in your card and you can look here and see, well, I've got, you know, the, the rods might be uh, causing some friction in that horizontal section where the pump is located. You know, so deviation surveys can be very helpful in your troubleshooting and figuring out what's going on with your well. All right, so I'm going to close that out. The two tools that I referenced um, just a minute ago were the depth reference line and then the full trace. So if you click on your annotations button, that pulls up this little annotations window here. So I have the ability to overlay previous shots, which I only have one shot on this example here. There's a depth reference line, and this line is really handy. I, I use this line quite a bit. So this line, if you'll see at the top, it, it gives you seconds. At the bottom, you have feet. All right, so as I move this up and down the acoustic trace, all right, so here if I wanted to get the time interval from my down kick at the liner to the liquid level and then from the liquid level to that up kick there, you know, that, that depth reference line is really helpful. Just jot down those those times and you can get that time interval calculated pretty easily. The other option here is the full trace. So that full trace annotation, when I click that, it's going to actually fold the trace right there at that liquid level. All right, so if I click full trace, it's going to take the last part of this fluid level shot and fold it over. So if I click full trace here, we're going to see this up kick fall right over here so you see where the up kick starts and this is where the down kick starts at that um, that liner top. All right, so that's another thing, another tool that you have that you can use to help you identify um, not only your food level but other kicks that you might see in the well. All right, let me turn that back off. And we'll go to question number four. All right, number four, which downhole marker should you choose? So from everything that we've learned so far, we want to choose a marker that's closest to the liquid level. So clearly here we have our wellbore overlay and our collar count. So clearly the collar count is not going to help us out. So we need to find out which of these reflections matches the gas lift valve that is as close to the liquid level as we can get. All right, so this is a a fun one to kind of work through. All right, so if you go to pick well and go to multiple kicks gas lift. So those of you that have gas lift wells, or you have wells that are gonna have multiple kicks, you've got multiple items in there that you're needing to line up. Sometimes it helps, it helps me. If I have a well like this, if I get a fluid level shot from someone and they have multiple kicks, they've got multiple uh, gas lift valves especially. If you click on your downhole markers, and you can move all the way, I'm clicking on this left arrow, all the way to the very top valve, and you can just start lining them up. Now, if you'll watch, as I place each one of these, so this first valve here that I've lined up, we have seen acoustic velocity of 1,136 feet per second, all right? It's 1136, and here's my liquid level, 11,328. So as I move down, you're going to see the acoustic velocity increasing. You're going to see the calculated liquid level depth changing. All right, so this is one way if you have a lot of gas lift valves, 
you can kind of work your way down. And if you keep your eye on the acoustic velocity, you know, if, if I place a marker wrong, then we see the acoustic velocity jumps up. Okay, if I, if I choose the wrong reflection kick, all of a sudden it kind of jumps up. instead of just the slight increase that we're kind of seeing as we work our way down. All right, so this is just kind of one thing to keep in mind. Um, it's a good exercise. Get as close to the liquid level as you can, and that's the one that you'll want to use for your down homework. All right. All right, so back to our workbook. I've got a screenshot of the downhole marker method in that um, valve selection, that down, downhole marker selection. And then here we've chosen the valve that's closest to the liquid level. Okay, number five. So here we have, we see a pretty big down kick here. This looks like an up kick. We're seeing some up kicks. So we enter the information from our wellbore schematic into the well file. We turn on our wellbore overlay. So that first big kick that the software is likely going to cause our, it's likely going to call our liquid level is actually the top of this liner right here. Okay, so there's our liner top. Then we have a tubing anchor. So here's the small down kick right there at our tubing anchor. And then we have um, several perforated intervals. And so we're seeing up kicks along these intervals here. And the fluid level is located right down here at the pump. All right, so there's our liner, tubing anchor, perforations, and then here's our liquid level. So this is one that is definitely going to make a difference if you have your well force schematic and you're able to kind of work your way down, paying attention to what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Another thing to help identify where your fluid level's at, you know, you can also get a dynamometer measurement. You know, if the, the fluid level is right here at the pump, you're going to see a pumped off card when you do your dynamometer measurement. So you want to make sure that the fluid level complements your dynamometer card, complements your pump card. All right, so I'll keep going here so we can get through these. So number six. Okay, where's the liquid level? So according to the well file, there's a liner that occurs at 5,240 feet. All right, so at first glance, this looks a lot like our first liquid level example, where this would be the liquid level. But we've learned a few things along the way. We've learned that the software is automatically going to pick the largest downward kick. We know that the fluid level reflection on a somewhat easy shot like this should be twice the distance from the liquid level. So let's just look at that first. So if this first kick here occurs at approximately 9.6 seconds, then the repeat would be at 19.2 seconds. Well, this kick occurs almost two whole seconds before that, so we know this must be something new that that pressure wave has reflected off of. All right, so according to the well file, there is a liner in this well that occurs at 5,240 feet. So we would go into our uh, well file, click on that mechanical well bore, and this, that's where we can go in and enter that liner top. And so once we do this, top kick here lines up nicely with our liner top and this is our liquid level down here and again this is another one you could also get a dynamometer measurement and you should see a pumped off card all right number seven correct the marker location and verify that the acoustic velocity is correct all right so this is another fun one to kind of do in TAM. So let's pull up TAM. And we'll go to our number seven here. So right off we can see that there's a there's a liquid level that occurs right here just past 0 0.6 seconds. And all of these reflections that we're seeing here are repeats of this top reflection kick. They're all the same time interval apart and the reflection kicks get smaller and smaller. So in both the TWM and the TAM software, the software is not going to be able to see the liquid level if it occurs within the first 
second or so of the shot being fired. And so this is by design because high liquid levels are often some of the more difficult to analyze and we want you to find that liquid level manually. So we can even try to, if I click on this previous and next kick, you see that the software isn't even acknowledging this kick here. So I'm going to manually move the liquid level to this first kick here. All right, so that's going to adjust our distance to the liquid. So the second part of our question is to verify that the acoustic velocity is correct. So one of the things that we can do is to go in and look at the caller count. How were the callers counted? <clears throat> so right now I see the acoustic velocity is 780 feet per second, and my distance to liquid is 243 feet. So if I click on the caller count, I can go in here and actually take a look at how the callers were counted. So I'm going to click on this plus sign here, and that's going to scale this up for me a little bit. We're going to go over here to the beginning of the shot. Okay, so these are my callers, and these red dotted lines are what the software counted. So you can tell it sort of skipped over every other one. So to line up the callers, what, what I normally do is I'll move this first marker to that first caller that I can clearly see. Now I need to adjust the spacing. And as I adjust the spacing, you can watch the acoustic velocity is going to change here. All right, so I'm adjusting the spacing as well as I can here. And so now we see that the acoustic velocity has increased to 1,256 feet per second. So one of the things that you need to do is to be aware of the average acoustic velocity to look for on your shots. And that's going to give you an idea of the quality of your shot. And if there's an additional analysis, maybe you need to go in and double check the color count. Maybe you need to check that the acoustic velocity was, um, how the acoustic velocity was calculated. All right. So um, this is also a really good one just to, to get used to moving the liquid level and adjusting those collars. So if you want practice doing that, please go in and look at this example number seven. That'll give you some um, some time doing some exercises on that using those tools. Okay, so these last two, let's see, or three here, let me just go back to the workbook and we can just stay here. All right, so the caller count must be corrected to get an accurate acoustic velocity. All right, number eight, what is happening on this shot? So this is a really good example of mechanical noise from the pumping unit showing up on the acoustic trace. All right, so here's some things that you can kind of look for. Mechanical noise has the same amplitude throughout the shot. So if you look at the amplitude here, the amplitude's the same. If it was a, a repeat of something, we would see the amplitude getting smaller, decreasing. When you take multiple shots, you're going to see that mechanical noise show up at different, time in, at different times on each shot, meaning it's it's not going to be repeatable from shot to shot. You're just going to see different noise. One of the best identifiers is to look at the data before you fire the shot. Look at that streaming data here at the beginning of the shot, right before you fire the shot. Right? So you'll see the repeating series of reflections. And often the software will even let you know there's a lot of noise on this shot. It may suggest you go ahead and add some more pressure to your shot. So on this particular acoustic trace, we don't have a problem seeing the liquid level. But if you have a shot where the noise is overcoming or hiding the liquid level location and making the shot difficult to analyze, then you may need to shut off the pumping unit briefly to fire the shot. Just remember when you shoot a fluid level on a producing well, you want to know where the liquid level is at under normal operating conditions. Once you shut down the pumping unit, conditions start changing. So you need to be ready to shoot the fluid level pretty quickly. So these last two are from TWM. I don't have the examples in the TAM data sets, but this is just another quick example of mechanical noise. So these uh, series of reflection kicks occur at regular time intervals that coincide with the pumping unit's strokes per minute. All right, and so you see here the, the height or the amplitude of the noise is the same. This last one here is uh, it's a good example of always making sure that you take multiple shots. Okay, so the, the software picked this first kick as the liquid level. And if you double that time, 
right? If you double that time from here to where the liquid level, level is at, um, what, this is at about 4.8 seconds, and you double that time, so the re repeat would occur at 9.6 seconds, which here it sure looks like it does. But what are these little kicks here? Well, I don't know because I couldn't find any other shots or information on this well, but if there is something physically in this well between eight and nine seconds, then this kick at 4.8 seconds cannot be the liquid level, okay? Um, if this is the liquid level and somebody stepped on the mic cable to the well analyzer right before the repeat, then yes, this could be the liquid level. So always make sure that you have a well bore schematic and always, always take multiple shots. It's gonna help make sure that you, you come away with a, a fluid level shot that you're gonna be able to, to um, count on as quality data. All right, so that is the end of the workbook there. I hope I didn't go that, through that too quickly, but I want to make sure that we've got plenty of time to answer your questions. Thanks, Karen. Yes, actually, we have a couple of more questions that have been corresponding through the private email, but I'm going to make some public questions. So uh, Brian is asking, uh, in a monomer completion gas producer well, when shooting through tubing, is there a possibility to get problems with the perforations in the bottom of the hole? For example, losing nitrogen uh, before to get to the liquid level. I think it's concerned on losing enough pressure or having a bigger echo from the curve and not getting down to the liquid level. Um, uh, monobore wells usually are uh, small diameter, so it's not always, but you know, let's just say it's a monobore, it's uh, down near Loreto, it's 2 and 7 H tubing for the, to the casing, and they call it monobore slim hole. Now, a monobore in Holland would be, um, our North Sea could be a 5 inch, 5 inch down tubing, so. Um, it's 1 and 7 inches, I think, corresponding. It's how, how big? Yes, seven inches. Is a so, so it's a big well. So, yeah, it's, a, so it's a really big well. So then we still want to look at the critical rate and make sure that we're below critical rate. Okay, because you know when you shoot is a well. Sh if the well is shut in or it's static, it is. It then is. the pressure is going to be high and the signal will carry very well. You'll see in the tube, you'll see perforation, you'll see liquid level. When you shut a gas well in, a monobore well in, the pressure builds up and the shots are easy. But when the pressure is low, it's going to be more difficult. And you're going to need to use more pressure in your gas gun. So if you're shooting a 200-pound a, a surface pressure uh, on a 7-inch monobore well, then I would put a lot of pressure on my gas gun because it's going to be a difficult shot. So so the, 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 the bigger the volume, the deeper the well, the, the bigger the changes in cross-sectional area, the more energy is going to be lost to the echoes, and so I would I would expect you'd see um, uh, more issues shooting a big monobore well than a small monobore well because there's a, a large change in cross sectional area. I want to use a large pressure charge. Okay, uh, well, any possible quick answer for which is better, using nitrogen or CO two? There's no answer. <laughs> No, there's not. Uh, there, the answer is yeah. it, it depends. So the pros and cons. Yes. Yeah. So you know, if you're if if you are doing a pressure transient test, and you use CO2, then the CO2 will freeze the gun during the night at a pressure drop when the temperature drops, and all your gas leak out of your cylinder and it won't work. So, so CO2 is a great gas to use when you're shooting a well with a pump in it. And you got a hundred wells to go shoot. Uh, a little tiny bottle lets you shoot all those wells because the liquid CO2 is in a cylinder, and it's easy. You get plenty of shots. If you're tracking a plunger and you and you fill your gas gun up with CO2 to keep the the remote fire gas gun vi valve closed, and you track the plunger and you take four four hours of data, when you discharge the gas gun, the CO2 has had four hours to absorb into the O-rings, and it causes the O-rings to burst due to the, the CO2 coming out of the O-rings. And you want to use nitrogen gas, so so there's not a there's there's not a good answer for which is the best. Each gas can be the best depending on your conditions of the well. Yeah. 
that uh, also casing pressure or wellhead pressure has a lot to do with that. Sure. Temperature, uh, ambient temperature, a number of shots I need to do. It's a lot of uh, things that we need to consider to say for your specific condition or well conditions it would be either CO2 or nitrogen the best gas to use. Yeah, probably if you're living in Siberia, you're going to use nitrogen gas. If you live in near the equator, you're going to use CO2. That's right. Okay, uh, Ibrahim is asking if uh, there are noise resulting from pump, I have to shoot down the pump, but after shutting the well, the dynamic liquid level will be changed, right? No, it depends. <laughs> I have seen time trying to answer every yeah. question with it depends. Depending on the so, inflow. So, yeah, so, yeah right. the inflow. So if you, have a, if you have a marginal well that's pumped off that makes a small amount of liquid, then the liquid level doesn't come in very fast. But if you have a, a well that produces three or four hundred barrels a day and you shut it off, then liquid level is going to come in and, and, and come near the, up to the the surface fast and it's going to uh, compress the gas and make the pressure build up and do all kinds of stuff when you shut the well off. So so yes. for wells that have high liquid production rates, you have to be really careful about turning the well off because it's going to change the liquid level and change the pressure build up. High producer ESP well, you don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, you just don't want to do it. You need to... Try to put more pressure in gas, going to get a better shot. Melena is asking for a gas well. Is it possible to identify a flow regime like annular flow in a gas well when identifying the liquid level? Not likely, because see the the if, when you have annular flow, that means you're typically above critical rate. Critical rate. So when you have the liquid level start to form, you, the the annular flow is reversed and it starts to go back down the well. So um, when we did the presentation on the session on gas wells, I showed a video that came from the uh, uh, shell that showed the, the reversal of the film on the on the wall of the tubing and it's a function of being above or below critical rate. So um, it's unlikely that you'll be able to see anything when you have a film on the wall because you're going to be really close to being above critical rate. I mean it's going to be a the liquid level is going to be at the surface or the mist level. The tubing will fill, be filled with a mist and it'll be near the surface, at the surface. Okay. Um, Andres is asking, what is the idea the ideal range of the percentage of tubing colors counted by the sulfur and why is it not included in the sulfur? Right. We so on the on all on the all colors screen we probably should show percent of collars counted. And so we should take the collars counted divided by the total collars from the surface to the pump. That would be the, the total joints of liquid. But we don't we haven't done that. And that that's a good that's a good recommendation to put that on the all collar screen so it shows the percent of collars that are counted. But normally say more than eighty five percent, you know, if, if the that it, you know, sometimes you can't get more than 85% because there's some kind of issue with the tubing joint or, or it's a certain certain noise or certain, I don't know, there's some kind of problem. But usually you can get a good color count close to the liquid level when the wells aren't aren't really deep. It's it's harder to get a 80% color count when the well's really deep because the acoustic velocity changes so much with depth due to temperature change. So I'd say probably the what we would say is at least 80% of the callers is what we recommend. We have a software question from Robert. He's asking, after making adjustments in the software, is it possible to reset all of the values back to the original data received after a shot? For instance, when sharing a file, someone edits the shot data. Can it be reset back to the original? Um, almost. Again? The answer is almost because if you click on lick, find fine-tune and you click on liquid level then on the upper left hand corner there's a reset button and you can say reset but the reset here doesn't one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't scale the signal to the original scale so if you close out the, this this uh, and you scale it up click scale up about three times that's what it looked like when you originally shot the fluid level and so the the, the the liquid level looks like it's at 1.2 something seconds and you don't really see the high liquid level until you scale it back down. So so 
So we can also reset the color count. It resets the color count, reselects select level selection, but yeah. it doesn't change the amplitude back to the original shot amplitude of the shot going off. And that's that's that's, I mean that, I don't know that that's the, if you click reset in TWM it, it resets the amplitude also. It's a little bit different in TAM than versus TWM. Yes, we had one more question that we will address by email regarding a gas leaf valve and echoes from those gas leaf valves because we run out of time. We have a few more questions. I've been trying to correspond to some of those in the chat. Well, let me say something real quick yeah. about the gas lift valve. Carrie did a presentation on gas lift uh, troubleshooting, and there's a lot of discussion about direction of kick on gas lift valves that we've already talked about. You might want to review that previous Ask Echo Meter. You can download and listen to it. A lot of discussion on that. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Lynn and Gustavo. And we would like to thank all of you for joining us today for the great questions, as always, and, and feedback. We hope you picked up something new in the event you do have any follow-up questions. We, of course, always welcome your calls and emails. So next week, Dieter, Gustavo, and Dr. Podio will be presenting part two of their static bottom hole pressure series. So if you haven't seen part one, you can go to our Ask Echo Meter webpage to session four and watch that um, shut in fluid levels in today's environment. We appreciate your time today, and we're so glad you joined us, and we look forward to seeing you all again next Wednesday. Hope you have a great week. Bye.